At some point, the American government drew a squiggly line across our vast landscape, paved it with asphalt, and slathered it in sweaty, neon-infused Bruce Springsteenian goodness. They called it Route 66. And today, I'm going to show you some of the pictures that I took along Route 66. Make sure you stick around to the end of the video to see the complete and unmitigated disaster that the end of this trip would become. Welcome back to Overexposed, the place that dreams are made of, so long as your dreams involve old cameras, fast food, and unfortunately, bad jokes. If you're following the storyline that is my life up to this point, I'm just as surprised as you are that the riders haven't killed me off yet. After a windy, rainy, and chaotic night, I woke up in the Guadalupe Mountains National Park where I'd slept in the back of my Prius on the side of the road like some technologically advanced hobo. And lucky for me, my favorite fundamental force, gravity, held me to the ground all night long and didn't tip my car over. As I left that next morning, I loaded a shiny new roll of Kodak Ektar 100 into my new Mamiya M645 and started the drive through New Mexico. In full candor, guys, this is the first roll of Ektar that I've ever shot, so I didn't know what to expect from the results. Well, that's not entirely true. I mean, it's film going into my camera, so the result's probably going to be some mediocre pictures. But that's why you're here, right? This was my first time ever in the state of New Mexico, although I'm pretty sure that I'd been to Old Mexico once before on a cruise. The New Mexico signs were really interesting. They said, Land of Enchantment. So I kept an eye out for wizards. As I traversed the stark landscape of New Mexico, the roads were impossibly straight. I'm talking Chuck Norris straight. But as I'm driving these roads, I notice there's monstrosity of a mountain off in the distance. And I mean, it's not getting really any bigger, any smaller. It's just kind of there on the horizon. And you can see it for what seemed like hundreds of miles. Anyway, along with the janky fence, I thought this would make for a pretty cool shot to start the day. Eventually, I made it to the town of Roswell, New Mexico, which I have to say was very alien forward, big, big alien vibe there. I stopped at a gas station to get some finger hats, and I was back on the road. It was still pretty early in the day, and I was making my way towards Route 66. I wanted to be there before nightfall, you know, to get a glimpse of those sick neon signs. As I drove through this vast and beautiful empty landscape, I reflected on the Electoral College and encountered some cows. These were the only life forms that I encountered for hundreds of miles. Anyway, I took some pictures. I think they turned out okay. Route 66 stretches from Chicago, Illinois, all the way to California, snaking across a large chunk of the United States. But because my wife had said that if I stayed gone too long, she would divorce me as well, I only drove a section of the mother road. As I drove through New Mexico with my windows down, it was well over 60 degrees. But as I continued north, the temperature started dropping really, really quickly. And much to my surprise, I was eventually in a winter storm. Unfortunately, that's gonna be a common theme on this trip. Again, that's foreshadowing. Lucky for me, at least at this point, temperatures were still rather warm. And although it was snowing, the snow wasn't really sticking. Yet. Eventually, I was out of the winter wonderland and I had arrived at my first stop along Route 66. I have to say, I was immediately shook by how dilapidated everything was. Some of the buildings looked like they'd been bombed out by the Germans. And here I was in the famed photogenic town of Tucumcari, New Mexico. After I'd finally learned how to spell it, vaguely pronounce it, I put my camera on my tripod and began looking for photo opportunities. Luckily, I wouldn't have to look for very long. The place looked like a killer's music video brought to life.
if there was a place that was peak Route 66, Tucumcari was it. As I pulled in, the sun was just starting to set, making the sky look just... wow. After taking a few shots, the sun finally dropped, and that's when Tucumcari really came to life. No, I don't mean it had anything in the way of not life, but the signs. It was all neon everything, and I pulled over beside this old famous motel and started taking pictures. Right now, I'm currently debating whether or not to use one of these as the thumbnail of the video. Jason beat me to it. There were so many awesome shots to be taken just in Tucumcari, and I would have stayed longer, but the short duration of my trip meant that I gotta keep moving. Now, traveling on Route 66, I encountered another town in rural New Mexico. And when I say this town was shut down, I mean it was 10 o'clock on a Wednesday morning and Buffalo Wild Wings shut down. Eastern Kentucky on a Sunday morning shut down. But this was high time for me to take some pictures. In all honesty, I didn't think these turned out that great, but hey, we out here. After having got my fill of the little town, I hopped back in the Prius and got back on the road. In the western part of the weird, squared off part of Texas, I found my way into the town of Shamrock. And this place is, holy crap, there's this, there's this old restored Conoco station that is absolutely spectacular. However, despite being such a cool thing to look at, it was kind of tough to photograph. Not only because it's huge, but because it's also surrounded by lots of modern businesses, which kind of make for some weird compositions. Seeing the old filling station was really cool, but it also made me a little bit sad. I mean, this was a really clear example of what Route 66 used to be, and I, and I know that I know that at one point there were these beautiful old fascinating structures lining the road, just kind of like buried treasures that you could pull into a little town and find. Now they're so few and far between. Now it looks like the best we can do is have one or two of them restored for a little bit of nostalgia. It's just kind of a bummer, only for the interstate to come through so people can save a few minutes off their drive. I'm sorry guys, that's a bad description of the plot of Cars. But anyway, it's time to get out of my fields. I walked around and took a few more shots. Then I was back on the road barreling through Texas. As I was passing through Texas, on the horizon I saw these little red dots kind of blinking everywhere. At first I thought it must be an alien invasion. But then I thought about it and I figured they were probably just wind turbines. However, I climbed up on the top of an embankment and took this shot with my newly acquired long lens. After that, I was in a state that I'd never been to, Oklahoma. And holy crap, I hadn't really given much thought to the fact that it was actually New Year's Eve. But as I pulled into my first city in Oklahoma, I was about to be reminded. I was in the town of Elk City, Oklahoma, and it was just after midnight. I guess it was New Year's Day now. Google Maps had kindly advised me that there was this giant neon Route 66 sign that I thought looked pretty cool and looked really great on my new role of Cinestill. And as soon as I pulled into the town, it was immediately busy. I pulled over, readied my gear, and snapped this image. While I was fumbling with my camera though, I would noticed that there was a cop that had passed me once. And then he passed me again. I didn't think too much about it and got back in my car. Almost as soon as I got back in my car and pulled out on the road, there were blue lights behind me. And I was promptly pulled over by the aforementioned officer. Pretextually, the officer approached me and asked to see my license and registration. And being the astute criminal defense attorney that I am, I asked him what crime he suspected I was committing. He said it was late, he didn't know what I was doing out, and sound like reasonable suspicion to pull me over. And he let me go. Sorry to say that the exchange with the officer had kind of killed my vibe for the night, and I decided it was time to pack it in. But wait, 
there's more. If you can believe it, this would only be the start of my trouble. I turned my attention to my favorite car camping pastime, which is to find a place to sleep through the night. And while I was in Elk City, I was really close to a much larger city called Clinton. Usually I don't like to stay in cities, but I kind of half hoped that I would be able to pull into Clinton and still find something to eat. Waffle House, anything. Just I, I, I hadn't had much real substantial food that day, like Slim Jims and Mountain Dew. In hindsight, going to the bigger city was going to be a great decision. I, as I pulled into Clinton, I was sorely disappointed that after midnight on New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, there was nothing open. So I found a parking lot, ate some more Doritos, and went to sleep. Now, when I went to sleep, the temperature was t-shirt weather. The temperature was in the 50s and really not. But while I was sleeping, the temperature would plummet nearly 40 degrees into the 20s. And that's when the weather would start. In the middle of the night at some point, I was woke up because I was a little cold. And honestly, that's pretty normal. The temperature drops quite a lot in the middle of the night, normally. So it's no big deal for me to fall asleep outside my sleeping bag, the middle of the night, wake up and get in my sleeping bag. But anyway, I climbed inside my sleeping bag, zipped it up, and fell back asleep. And then I woke up again to what sounded like a million pieces of sand blowing into my car and tons and tons of wind. I looked out the window and it was snow and ice. And that's when I got a little scared. And in fact, it was so loud and concerning, I couldn't go back to sleep. And to make matters worse, every time I looked at my cell phone, the temperature was getting colder and colder and colder. And now I was cold inside my sleeping bag. At this point, I unzipped my sleeping bag, climbed out, and decided to put my clothes back on. I crawled over the center console, into the front seat, and then I pressed the button to turn my car on. It failed to start. Nothing. It failed to start. And a red battery indicator came on on the dash. I started to get really nervous at this point. The sudden temperature drop had caused the starting battery in the Prius to deplete. This was a 10-year-old car, and as far as I know, the battery had never been replaced. To make matters worse, I remembered that I hadn't been able to find any food on the way in that night, and that it was New Year's Day. That's when the panic started to set in. I, I text my wife what's going on, freak out for just a moment, and then I start to collect myself. I immediately put on all of my clothes and climbed into the sleeping bag and tried to get myself as warm as possible, which was easier said than done. I sat in the front seat for a few minutes and tried to figure out what to do next. I look, I look, I, I pull out my phone and. I pull out my phone and punch in hardware store to see where the nearest hardware store is if I might be able to walk to the nearest place. And luckily, there's one just, just below the hill, literally hundreds of yards away. So I decided to walk in and see if I could find a battery. Unfortunately for me, it's still really early and the store's not open. Anyway, I wait outside for a little while and eventually the store opens. I walk straight to the battery section and they don't have it. I mean, they have tons of car batteries, but not but just not the janky size that Toyota Prius requires. As I get back in my car and think about what to do next, the thought occurs to me to call AAA. And after I sign up for that membership, they happily tell me that they'll send someone out in a few hours. And to my surprise, a gentleman comes within the hour. He gets there, he crawls into my car, hooks the jumper leads up to his car, and then I press the starter button and luckily my car comes on. It's back to life. And I'm so happy, so, so happy. I thank the man profusely, and suddenly I'm back in business. At that point, it's only the treacherous, snowy, and icy road standing between me and a stretch of highway to take me back to Eastern Kentucky. But first, I route my Prius to an auto parts store where I buy a brand new battery, the appropriate size for the Prius. I install this battery and continue back east. After getting out of the frozen tundra of Western Oklahoma, with each mile that passed, the temperature starts to raise, and eventually I'm all the way back home into Kentucky. What a freaking adventure to in five days drive all the way from Barberville, Kentucky to Texas and back. And despite all the trouble that I ran into, I had an amazing time. Got to see lots of new sites and made wonderful photographs and memories. Guys, I only explored a section of Route 66. There are tons of other places to see. I can't wait to get back out there and try another section of the road. I'm sure there are infinite photographic opportunities that await. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you thought this adventure was cool, check out this other one.